Thank you all so much for joining today. Looking forward to talking about the toolkit and then answering any questions as we go along. Um, Tabitha and I are just going to introduce ourselves and Rachel can introduce herself too at the beginning. And then we'll go ahead and talk about the toolkit. So my name is Ann Runkle. I'm an EM and pediatric EM physician in Ohio. So I work in Columbus at Nationwide Children's and The Ohio State University. Um, Tabitha. Sure, thank you, Anne, um, and thank you everyone for being here and your interest in taking better care of kids in the pre-hospital environment. Um, my name is Tabitha Chang. I'm a pediatric emergency medicine, emergency medicine and um, emergency medical services and disaster faculty at Harbor UCLA in Los Angeles. Um, very excited to um, show you all of our resources today. Hi, yeah, thanks, and Tabitha. I'm Rachel Alter. Um, I co-lead the National Pre-Hospital Pediatric Readiness Project along with Drs. Kathleen Algase and Kathy Brown, and I'm just here for uh, support and helping with the questions um, that may come um, out of this meeting. So thanks, everybody, for joining, and I'll let um, Anne and Tabitha take it. All right, so I'm going to start with a very brief introduction to the toolkit. And then we'll go into highlighting a lot of the resources for EMS education. So I'm going to start screen sharing. You should be able to see my website right now. Um, so I'm just going to move this briefly. No, oh, sorry. So you all may have seen this before. So this is the National Pediatric Readiness Checklist. This is going to roll out as a survey to EMS agencies in 2024. Um, it's a two-page checklist that goes through seven different areas, including education, equipment, patient, and medication safety. And to prepare everybody for answering this and to take the best possible care of children, we decided to develop a toolkit starting last November. This was released in 2022 which corresponds to every single item in this checklist. So if you go through this and you say, huh, I don't know if we have a process in place for teaching skills such as pediatric airway management, what you would do is say, okay, that's in the education and competencies section. Let's go to that section of the toolkit. So the toolkit is on the EIAC website. If you just search pre-hospital pediatric readiness toolkit, it should show up. Um, just to be, be careful that you include the pre-hospital because there's another toolkit for emergency department uh, uh, pediatric readiness, which will take you in an entirely different direction and will not correspond to the checklist. So if you, and if you want to follow along on your own computer, feel free to do that. So if you search for the EMSC pre-hospital pediatric readiness toolkit, you'll end up on this website that includes seven sections, which line up exactly with the checklist that will come out in 2024. Um, for example, you have uh, education and competencies for providers. If you click into the section, you'll have subsections that also correspond with the sections on the checklist. So there was the psychomotor skills, the behavioral skills, and the cognitive skills. It should be organized exactly identically to the toolkit, which Rachel's taken a really, done a very good job of making sure those all line up. Um, the reason these are organized very well is the search function is the only real bummer of this toolkit. It does not work. So for example, here, if you knew, oh, hey, I think there's a, a, there's a educational module about child abuse and you search abuse, even in the education section, you don't get a matching result. So we are working on fixing that. But for now, just know that if you click into the right section of the toolkit, you will find the correct resource. Um, any questions about that for now that I can address? I know the main thing we're working on here is the, um, is the search function. The other thing we're doing is quarterly, we're going through each section and updating with new resources, taking out old dated resources, and making sure that if any links are broken, we're fixing them because that is an issue with previous toolkits. I'm just going to take a quick look in the chat. Looks like no questions so far. So I'm just going to go ahead and start with the first section and highlight some of the great resources. So the first one I'm going to highlight is in the education and competencies for providers section. So here I'm going to highlight a couple of resources in each section. So for the first one, there's procedural skills. 
If you click into that, you'll see there's 15 different results. And the first one I was gonna go and highlight is the Pediatric Airway Toolbox. So each resource will tell you a couple of things about it. So it will tell you that it's an interactive module as opposed to other resources that might be an infographic or a practice guideline. So you'll know if you're clicking on this, this is a module you could use for training with your agency or your staff. If you wanna know more about it, you can click on the details button and it will say, this is all, all elements to conduct a training night focused on pediatric airway assessment and management. And if you complete it, you'll get two pediatric CME hours. Um, and then other things you can see is that we generally have a summary of how long something is. Like this will take half an hour for students to prepare. The lecture and sim are an hour and a half long. Um, with documents, we'll tell you how long it is so you don't open up a 900 page document without knowing what you're getting into. So this is the first one I'm highlighting, which is the Pediatric Airway Toolbox. This is a resource from Utah EMS for Children. And it takes you to a Google Drive. And if you take a look at this, if you start with one, this will give you everything you need to know to basically have a pediatric airway night without having to plan it yourself. So this is all pre-planned. So if you take a look and click into the instructions, it will tell you what your student prep is. It will tell you what materials you need for training. It will give you a post-test evaluation. So you can use this as an assessment for um, your agency, like your pre-hospital providers. And then it will have optional activities and suggested equipment. So the, I think the huge thing here is that this is an airway, this air, pediatric airway is a huge educational need, but it can be daunting to come up with a, an entire night like this on your own. And this is a prepackaged uh, educational session that you can just roll out for your agency or organization. So it includes important documents like your airway study guide. So you would give this out to all of your providers before. Um, the, the planned educational session. It includes the answers to the study guide and it includes a roster for everybody who's attending so that they can get CME credit. The next thing it does is it makes, it has a PowerPoint for you on all of pediatric respiratory review that should have all of the answers people know to confidently go through the stations. So you don't have to come up with your own PowerPoint. It has everything that you need in order to go through pediatric res a respiratory assessment. And this is an editable PowerPoint. If you wanted to add like agency specific things, you could do that and say like, hey, you know, it says this is what we would, this is what we do, but we don't carry that piece of equipment. Here's what we would use instead. It has uh, two different scenarios. So a medical and a trauma scenario, including specific level based interventions. So for your, you would have your EMT, your advanced EMT and your medics could do different things in different situations. Um, so they, so every different level that works for your agency or service could be tested on the same scenario. So there's a medical and a trauma. And then at the end, there's evaluations, there's a pre and post test um, for the scenario as well um, with the appropriate answers. So I thought this was a really great resource for a kind of an educational topic that comes up frequently, but can be daunting to approach on your own. Um, another thing I wanted to highlight here, we have a lot of videos for pediatric specific skills. So one of these is intranasal medication administration. You can see again here, it's a video, it's four minutes long, and it's from Colorado EMS for children. If you want to do specific peds, um, peds uh, procedural skill education, this is a four, like three and a half minute long video on intranasal med administration. So it's something where you can get ex, extra additional expertise on how to do these pediatric skills. And again, once you see this resource, you could see, oh, hey, this was a great video. If you look up Colorado Children's EMSC, um, we can't link all of their videos in our toolkit, but they have an entire website with peds. Uh, pediatric specific skills, including IO, push pull fluids, bag valve mask, using a length based tape. We have about four of these on our um, in our edu educational toolkit, but we can't just put every single video, but it can give you a, uh, a sense of what resources might be good if you want to do some more education and where to look next. So that was the procedural skills section, just kind of a highlight of two of the videos there. The next section is behavioral or communication skills. Um, two resources I wanted to highlight here is one called Managing the Frightened Child. And this is an article 
that also includes videos and would be a basis for a great training session on how to interact with children. This is mostly hospital-based, but there's also pre-hospital-based resources. So I think the most important things here that are you can teach people how to kind of assess uh, how to approach a, a, a frightened child. And then also it includes about 10 different videos of ways that you can approach a child, how to arrange the parent and the child in the room to minimize the child's fear and developmentally appropriate activities you can use to distract a child and get them to be, move from frightened to engaged. So a lot of these are low resource and things that you could do in the pre-hospital setting. And another great resource here that comes up frequently for training requests is this autism first responder training video. So this is from the Autism Society of Central Texas. It's a 26 minute video that specifically gave, uh, oriented to first responders. So EMS, fire and law enforcement and includes interviews from pre-hospital providers with children with autism as well as medical specialists on what first responders can do um, when they may be react, they may be called to a scene where their patient does have autism. So this is focused specifically on children, but there's some information also on adults as well. Um, and the aim of this is to provide education to prevent escalating and causing any harm to these patients when they may just be scared. And then the last two resources I'm going to highlight in the education section are in the cognitive skills section. Um, so one really great one here that people may not know about is Simbox EMS. So this is a repository of simulations. And I think the great thing about them here is you can run them like on your own at your, like your organization or agency's edu like continuing education. Another good thing is these can be run over Zoom. So if you wanted to partner with a local children's hospital where there might be an expert there who can run through the, the sim with all of your pre-hospital providers to provide extra expertise, but can't drive the two hours you know, there and back to make it, you can run these simulations remotely with somebody who is not there at your station. So here, if you look, there's Simbox and Simbox EMS. If you hit Simbox EMS, they have, it's six or seven different scenarios where you have seizing infants, children, sick neonate, trauma, fussy infant, vomiting infant, newborn delivery, scald burn. So really important educational topics. If you were to run it on your own, it gives you a booklet for exactly how to run the scenario using the resources provided, exactly what equipment you'll need. And it will also provide you with a video. So for example, if you run the seizing child scenario, you'll click on this video and you have a timeline over 40 minutes with a scenario including vital signs of a seizing child. And if you are facilitating this scenario, if you look into the booklet, it will tell you kind of what points in the video certain uh, uh, actions or interventions should be performed. For example, here it says at minute eight, the team arrives and the child is hypoxic. If they reposition the airway and clear secretions and begin bag valve mask ventilation, you continue playing the video and the child's oxygen saturation improves. However, they mention if the team doesn't do that, doesn't notice the hypoxia, you keep rewinding the video so the kid stays hypoxic. Um, and you can just continue using this video. And it also gives guidelines at the end for how to debrief the scenario and go through key learning points um, with all of your, uh, with, with everybody who's attending your educational session. Um, the last resource here I wanted to highlight is the um, Identify Child Abuse module, also out of Colorado. So if you click here, um, this is about a one hour long module that requires, um, it requires a free login, but anybody can make an account. And what it will do is people can do this individually, or this could be as part of an educational session. You'll start with a particular injury and you'll get a history and physical exam 
And what your job is to do is figure out, is this something that I would need to report to social services if I saw this child with this history and this injury? And what they do is it's not like a, uh, it's, it, there's not um, PowerPoints or anything like that. What you do is you learn along with each specific case. You hit yes or no. It tells you if you're correct or if you're wrong and why. And you can move through all of these cases as you would in, in real life. Um, that is it for the educational resources. I'm going to stop screen sharing so that Tabitha can move on to the next section. Thank you, Anne. Um, thank you for that introduction, as well as um, going over one of my favorite sections, the um, education and competency section of the um, toolkit. Just give me one second. And... Um, so our next section um, of the toolkit is the equipment and supplies section. And in, in this section, there's some pretty great resources here for EMS agencies, including equipment checklist examples that include pediatric specific equipment necessary to take care of children, um, as well as other things like um, training grant opportunities. Um, Oh, sorry, I went into the wrong section. Um, so um, here we see um, different equipment checklist examples, um, as well as um, the equipment and supply grant information. Um, that is really great for um, finding um, opportunities for um, grants. So I'm going to start with this first um, document um, for specifically um, highlighting because as EMS educators, um, we should be up to date on um, the required equipment. Um, and this was a um, joint position statement by the American Academy of Pediatrics, American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma, EMS for Children Innovation Center, Innovation, Innovation and Improvement Center, the Emergency Nurses Association, and the National Association of State EMS Officials. And it was also endorsed by the um, National Association of EMTs. And this position statement was an update from the position statement in um, 2014. Um, and it does a really great job. So starting on page four is my favorite part about um, this position statement because, sorry, the table. Um, so there's a great table here and it highlights pediatric specific stuff. So for example, under our airway ventilation and oxygenation section, um, there is stuff throughout here saying that we should have devices capable of delivering oxygen um, for fitting neonates through adults, but um, then even more pediatric specific are highlighted here in gray. Um, so we should have a bulb section on our BLS um, ambulances and within our BLS kits. Um, for the bleeding, hemorrhage, shock, hemorrhage control, shock management, and wound care, um, pediatric specific equipment for ALS level is chest decompression needles of appropriate size for pediatrics. Then moving on to um, the medication and delivery section, um, one of the biggest things that I teach my medics is uh, making sure that you have resources for pre-calculated weight-based dosing so that you're not making any dosing mistakes um, on the fly in these critical situations where you're already stressed because a pediatric patient is in front of you and you've all of a sudden got a calculate a weight-based dosing. So making sure that these are in all BLS kits or on ambulances, and um, then on the ALS level, making sure that there's um, devices that are suitable for um, fluid boluses to pediatric patients that um, limit any um, inadvertent over-administration of fluids. Then moving on to the neonatal care section, it gives you a really nice list of all the newborn delivery supplies, which um, I used um, this for um, our neonatal sim at um, our UCLA paramedic school and was able to um, previously be able to like make sure that everything was in the kit that we should have. And um, it's great to like double check things with this. Um, so moving on to our next resource. So 
Um, within the, the equipment section, um, as I mentioned, this equipment and supply grant information section um, has several different either grant organizations or websites that help you find grants that support EMS agencies as well as EMS educator um, organizations. So for example, um, there's um, all of these different organizations and things even like the Walmart local community grants. So this is a small grant um, that's up to a maximum of $5,000 that um, that concentrates on improvement in public safety through supporting training programs um, or equipment in the local service area. And so although it's only a small grant for this specific funding opportunity, it may help you as an educator fund new and in innovative ideas for your EMS learners or replace a broken set of your equipment. Um, so thank you. Um, and I will stop share so that Anne can um, go and walk us through our next section. Okay, so the next one is patient and medication safety, which is also a shorter section. So if you go through here, the main things on the eventual checklist would be safe medication dosing and safe transport of children. So if you go into the safe medication dosing section, um, this, is, this includes a lot of resources, but they're all focused on preventing medication errors when you have uh, again, a high stakes situation with an ill child in front of you that can come in a wide range of sizes and ages. So the thing here is going to be finding, it's basically explaining different methods of using pre-calculated doses for pediatric patients in the pre-hospital environment. Um, a lot of this is the evidence behind that recommendation, um, but I, the resource I want to highlight here is the Michigan Medication Emergency Dosing and Intervention Cards. So this is an example of a resource that if your state or your agency does not have a pre-calculated dose, you could use this as a possible resource. I know a lot of agencies are using either the Braslo tape or hand heavy as systems. This is an example of a statewide dosing, uh, volumetric dosing system that you could use, but it could also be used to develop your local statewide or regional dosing, like volumetric dosing system. Um, this is an example for uh, cards that could be like with you on board. Um, for example, this is a six, and a, six um, to seven kilo, three to six month child on the Braslow tape. And if you look for your critical medications like epinephrine, lidocaine, you would see exactly what volume you should be giving rather than having to calculate it in the moment. So if you go through, they'll have this for each weight and uh, each weight and size on the Braslow tape. Um, and it will include specific volumetric doses um, for your specific concentration. So again, this would be something that you would have to check um, the concentrations that are used against what you carry, but this could be a really good example for development of a volumetric dosing book. Um, this, they improved their um, kind of rate of accurate medication doses from kids to about from 25% to 75% for things like cardiac arrest and anaphylaxis. So just having a volumetric dosing reference like this is huge for patient safety. Um, the other thing I, resource I wanted to highlight is back in the safe transport of children resources. I know Tabitha is going to go over a different one later, um, but one resource here that could potentially be its own lecture is this webinar from the Mar Maryland EMSC. That's an hour long video about safe transport of children in ambulances. So this could be it's an, an entire educational session on its own. And what I like best about this is it, it gives the history, it gives the importance of why safe transport for children is important. But what it will also does is it goes through specific video scenarios with securing um, various commercial-based devices to, um, the, to your stretcher. And then also goes through, here, I'll mute this. They, they go through how to secure various, like kids to various um, commercial-based devices. And they also go through videos of how to secure, like, uh, let's see this one. This is just 
a video of securing a, a regular a car seat to your stretcher. So they go through car seats, they go through a bunch of different commercial, commercial devices and then standard car seats and how you actually go through doing this. Um, and just having a video of this can be great for education as opposed to a lot of the state protocols and policies, which are picture-based rather than video-based. So you can't see some of the details about securing um, the devices to the stretcher. Um, it's a little bit out of date, it's from 2016, but a lot of these devices have not changed much in the past six years. Right, so I'm gonna stop my screen sharing and turn it over to Tabitha for the next section. Thank you, Anne. Um, this next section um, is our se section um, on patient and family-centered care in EMS. And this next section houses resources specific um, to, to patient and family-centered care. And they're organized by communication tools, um, disaster preparedness, um, guidelines and resources, and human trafficking. Um, and here, um, I want to go over just a couple of resources, although there's there's a lot of great ones here, but specific for EMS educators, um, I wanted to show you um, a couple of things that I use um, when I'm teaching uh, I te uh, when I'm teaching paramedics. Um, so, this is one thing that I've used in the past in just a scenario-based teaching guide. Under the communication tools, there's um, all of these different um, these different resources, but specifically, I want to highlight this one, the communication cards. There's a bunch of different examples here that you can use in a scenario-based teaching or small group teaching or potentially even like Zoom breakouts where um, you these cards help um, uh, our medics and our EMTs be able to communicate with um, with children and children and adults with special health care needs or those with language barriers um, and all of these different little pictures and such help um, potentially somebody be able to communicate that couldn't verbally communicate. And so I've in the past broken up students into groups and um, given them little scenarios and had somebody role play and it's been a really fun exercise. So um, things to um, think about. There's multiple different resources within this section based in different states that are also just as good as this first um, Alaska one. Um, the next resource in our this um, section on patient and family-centered care and EMS that I wanted to uh, um, focus on is um, this within our um, guidelines and general resources section, we have a um, webinar and a set of slides that is, uh, in my opinion, really, really well done and such an important topic. Um, so this webinar is um, a, a webinar that um, is titled the ABCs of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. And it's a focus on pre-hospital pediatric behavioral health um, emergencies by Kinshata Watkins, um, who um, is a pediatric emergency medicine fellow out of um, UCSF Children's. Um, the webinar does a remarkable job of teaching an organized approach to pediatric baby behavioral health patients focusing on equity, diversity, and inclusion. And it's short, it's only about 13 and a half minutes. So it's something that you could share as a part of um, either your pediatric behavioral health section in, in paramedic or EMT school or um, as um, assigned as homework or something else. Um, so moving on to our next section. So just scrolling backwards, we're going to um, move into our policies, procedures, and protocols section. Um, and in this section, there are quite a bit of different um, sections and they're organized into the following categories and I'll only highlight a couple of them um, that are specific to educators but um, they are edu they're organized in dispatch protocols and pre-arrival instructions model guidelines and protocols 
pediatric assessment, consent treatment and refusal of minors, child maltreatment, trauma triage, children with special health care needs, medical oversight, and pediatric destination policy. Um, so first, I'm going to highlight this uh, a resource within our dispatch and pre-arrival instructions. And this is a, um, a state-specific um, guide cards out of New Jersey. Um, this is actually um, something that I've, I've, I've noticed when teaching, um, even paramedic students have, who have been in um, EMS for quite a while, they don't quite know what goes on from the dispatch side. So it's great to um, have these cards and show them kind of what happens on the dispatch side and how um, terrible sometimes the information the dispatchers get. And that's why when they're dispatching them out for calls, they don't have all the information or they're giving them um, poor information. Um, so this is um, kind of goes through some, some specific um, pre-arrival instructions for um, different complaints, includes um, some of the more hot topics like cardiac arrest, which is um, one of the ones that I use um, in um, teaching them about how hard it is to um, give dispatchers assist assisted CPR and give those instructions to somebody over the phone and know that they're doing it correctly. Um, so moving back to another resource, um, so going back to our pediatric protocols and guidelines resources, um, one of the greatest um, resources in this section, which is very, very long, um, but if you have a specific um, a specific thing that you're teaching about, this is great, especially if you don't have um, local protocols that you're teaching your paramedic program around. Um, some paramedic programs teach their like local um, local city-based protocols or state-based protocols, but some like to stay more general in order to pass the um, the final like an RMT exam and then teach more specific. Um, and so this is great because it's it's very generalized. This is model EMS clinical guidelines that was just recently updated in March of 2022. And um, this has very, very well developed with multiple PEM, pediatric emergency medicine physicians that and EMS physicians that contributed to this. Um, and there's pediatric specific guidelines. Some states don't have these pediatric specific guidelines even. So um, you may um, end up resourcing this even if you have some um, guidelines within your state. But for example, like for our brief resolved unexplained events or, or bruise, um, they it goes through all of the like inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria, and our patient um, assessment, including the history and exam and any treatment interventions. Um, I um, these are these are great to to reference while you're teaching about these specific um, subjects. And then um, our last resource is also within this section, um, and it is under the safe transport, which is all the way down here. Oops, on. Safe transport of children guidelines and protocols here. And I'm going to go over a specific um, guideline that I've used prior, um, and it is through main EMS. And there's a bunch of different um, location specific um, things, but um, similar to the video that Anne showed you in the last section, this is great because it gives um, at least exposure to um, paramedic and EMT students um, about um, safe transport in children. And um, if there are specific devices that you use in your training agency or within your agency, um, it gives you um, some teaching material to be able to use. So, and it uses pictures. Again, this is a, a little bit like out outdated in that these are older pictures, but um, a lot of the material is still up to date and um, great to use um, to show these specific skills that should they should be developing. Okay, um, thank you. And we'll be walking you through the next section.
So the next section of the toolkit is quality improvement. So if you look at the original checklist itself, um, there's a section on quality improvement and performance improvement or process improvement. There's different abbreviations for the PI process. Um, but um, the specific things that are gonna be important for the checklist is that your PI process includes pediatric encounters and that you have pediatric specific measure, measures in your quality improvement or performance improvement process. So a lot of the time that pediatric specific measure is going to be the NEMSQA measure, which is the pediatric patients have an estimated or documented weight in kilos that's recorded, but your organization may want to do some specific pediatric quality improvement programs. And what's hard there is where do you start? Like you want to pick um, a quality improvement initiative that is actually going to be achievable and measurable, and you don't want to spend a lot of time and efforts on something that may not be achievable or measurable. So what I want the resource I want to highlight here in the quality improvement section is the quality measures for pediatric pre-hospital evidence-based guidelines. So these were developed by Manish Shah, and they're specifically for pre-hospital organizations who want to do pediatric-specific QI projects. So if you click on this, you'll get nine different categories of potential projects. So there's airway management, allergic reactions, asthma, bronchiolitis, croup, pain, seizures, shock, and spinal care. And these are measures that are gonna be perfect for a pediatric specific QI or PI project. So for example, say you said, I really wanna make sure that every kid with anaphylaxis is getting uh, IM epi in an, within an appropriate time. Um, so what you could do here is look specifically under allergic reaction and what they've got here, they have a whole bunch of different measures, but one of them is, percent of patients that receive epi for anaphylaxis within 10 minutes of on-scene arrival. That's something that is measurable and it's achievable. It's not saying percentage of patients that receive epi for anaphylaxis within 30 seconds of on-scene arrival. So these are very well thought out measures that could be used to um, actually imp improve pediatric care for your agency. Um, other things that you could see here, for example, for seizure, you might say, I really wanna make sure that all our pediatric patients who have seizures or seizures are their primary impression, we wanna make sure that all of those kids had a glucose checked on them. So if we look here, they're under risk assessment, it says percentage of patients who had a blood glucose checked. And that is mostly in the domain of safety. Like every single child who's having a seizure should have their blood glucose checked. There's a whole bunch of other measures here. For example, like time to administration of benzodiazepines. And that's more something like, hey, I wanna see where we're at and should we improve that? But for example, they do not specifically have the measure um, percentage of patients that receive a benzo within 10 minutes of on-scene arrival because many of these patients with seizures may not require a benzo if, they, if their seizure has already resolved. So these are really, these are really well thought through um, pediatric quality improvement measures that could be used as a basis for any QI or PI projects um, for your service. Um, there's also a bunch of resources from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, as well as this manual that's a little bit out of date, but there is no more recent um, uh, manual that is an entire 58 page booklet on quality improvement for pre-hospital providers. So it's specifically, um, specifically focused towards QI and PI in the pre-hospital environment and includes specific um, QI and PI sheets from other pre-hospital agencies um, that you can use as templates for your developing your process. And I'll turn it over to Tabitha. Thank you, Anne. Um, so this is our last section in the toolkit. Um, this section is titled Interactions with Systems of Care. Um, there's two resources that I want to highlight in this section, but um, this section specifically um, helps um, with the care for pediatric patients across the continuum of care. Um, and the resources are organized by disaster preparedness, handoffs, and transfers. 
um, human trafficking, mental and behavioral health, and then um, the PEC roles and job descriptions. Um, so the first um, resource that I wanted to highlight is within the human trafficking section. Um, this document um, that what, um, or this, sorry, interactive module, what EMS um, providers need to know about human trafficking is a module that's really great for either asynchronous training, um, either in parts or as a whole, um, and then to discuss afterwards. Um, and it, it you it gives you all of the objectives of the training and then um, how to um, navigate this different training um, on this section. But um, even without um, doing any asynchronous training, you can pull some of these into your um, lectures on human trafficking, um, especially covering the red flags portion um, in order to just um, make people aware, make your learners aware of um, these, these red flags for um, whether to recognize human trafficking in their patients, because um, without knowing these, um, they may overlook some patients that really need our help. Um, next, I wanted to highlight um, the another section, which is um, the within our human trafficking um, section as well, and it's identification, trauma informed care, and how human trafficking affects the victim's health. So this is a fantastic set of three very short eight minute videos that you can integrate into your education. If you're short on time, this first video is really important in showing how to recognize human trafficking um, to our EMS learners. And um, given that it's only eight minutes, it's, it's pretty easy to integrate into things and um, it's a very well done um, video. Uh, and then last, um, so this is um, the next and last resource that I have that I've used as an educator previously is um, within our disaster section. And the, this is a fantastic section when you're preparing for any disaster um, exercises, either um, either just training for them, or if you're within your agency and you're doing a disaster drill, there's um, things all the way from like pediatric tabletop exercise resource kits. And this gives you really, really detailed stuff for um, different specific disaster scenarios. Um, there's there's a whole hospital to toolkit if you wanna show your EMS learners how to um, how to interact with the hospital, um, things like the family reunification. Um, this is very, very important in pediatric patients and often overlooked because for adult patients, we don't have to, um, we, we don't necessarily have to think about it in, unless they're not able to um, give that information on their own or very critically ill. Um, and so the one fun resource that I wanted to highlight just to um, show you um, is this six, 60 Seconds to Survival. So this is a disaster um, triage video game. And um, I'm not going to go through the different, hold on one second, let me see if I can pull this, different or the beginning regist registration and stuff. But basically you register for it, you get a log on name, and it um, there's uh, multiple kind of positive and sections to get into the different scenarios. But once you're in it, um, you, you basically get to like play um, a disaster scenario, which is not as great as doing like an actual in-person scenario or even a tabletop. But um, if you've only got like 20 minutes of time at the end of your disaster lecture in your education, this is great for them to practice um, start and jump start. Um, and so they have the different scenario and it, it kind of sets it up. Um, hopefully this one loads. Okay. It loaded earlier. Sorry. Um, anyhow, it, um, will tell you what you're responding to. So for this, um, they're a city fire department responding to a house fire. It's 3 AM and there's, it's a two family dwelling. And then it start, you're the ambulance crew. You're first on scene. And then, um, 
the victims have all been brought out to the lawn. And then you are able to start the scenario. You click on the little, the victims after like calling out and calling out for additional resources. And um, you're able to triage the victims and um, practice it. And it's under time pressure. So it's a little bit of a more realistic scenario than kind of just giving them a sheet of paper with all of the uh, vitals on it right in front of them. Uh, so. Um, a cool resource that can be used um, if you're um, if you're looking for stuff for disaster scenarios. Okay, um, I am going to stop share. Um, that was our last resource um, for uh, this toolkit, uh, and we were going to open it up to any questions. Uh, hold on. Yeah, so if you have any questions, um, either in the chat or um, we can go through this. Yeah, and for those of you that are monitoring the chat, um, Rachel put in the um, direct links to them. Sorry, Ann, for interrupting. Oh, no, I was just going to say what Rachel had also said in the chat. In all of the toolkit subsections, there's a button to submit content. Um, so if you've found something that you think really should be in there, um, or if you find you know a link's not working or something goes to the wrong spot, if you just click on that button, it will go right to the toolkit team. So we're hoping that this will be a, a you know living document and can, will continue to be updated with new resources. All right. If nobody has any questions, I'm happy to just leave this open for a little bit. Um, see if anything else filters in here. Um, but in the meantime, I will drop the link in the chat to register for CEUs for this webinar. And additionally, I will make sure in tomorrow's follow-up email, all of those really helpful links um, are sent out, um, as well as the email that Rachel had put in there, um, and also the link to the recording of this webinar. So I think I still don't see any questions coming through. Um, so I guess we can wrap it up, but I wanted to thank you all so much for being here and presenting with us today. This was an immensely helpful resource. Um, and I know that NEMSI really appreciates it. So thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Of course. Thanks. Thanks. All right, everybody have a great day.